Welcome to Building Safe Workplaces, a podcast where experts dedicated to workplace health and safety review relevant industry topics. This podcast is brought to you by the Health and Safety Council. Welcome to today's podcast. I'm your host, Tommy Nip. I'm here with a co-host, Miss Nina LeBlanc. Hello, thank you. And our guest today is Mr. Alex Falcon. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank so, you for having me. Alex, you're the guest of honor today. So would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, currently I, um, I've been involved in the oil and gas industry almost all of my life, my young uh, adult life, I should say. Um, I've done everything from driving trucks during school while I was in school and and now I'm actually the uh, the regional sales manager of a, a company called Morgan City Rentals out of the South Louisiana region. We, our parent company is uh, Bishop Lifting Products. Uh, they're cored more out of the Houston area, but we, we stretch across um, pretty much the South Coast. We get into the n- Northwest and a little bit into the, the Northeast side of the country, mm-hmm. 28 locations. Um, we all have a few different names and we're actually rebranding some things right now. And, uh, but I've, I've been with the company a little over 15 years and uh, I've done a few things for the company from inside sales to sales and into management on the management side. Excellent. What has management been like here lately? It's, it's been a little different. It's uh, not that we've had anything in the last two years that would no, make yeah. things no, no, different, nothing right? At nothing unusual at all. <laughs> um, you know, during the, the, the COVID time, um, we had to get really creative with our sales team uh, because we turned into a world of being able to see or the customer demanding a face-to-face presence with a salesperson uh, in order to create those relationships. Uh, and then it turned into not only people work from home, you know, that that's, seems to be a common thing now is that people work from home, but also um, th- there's always a mandate, even if they're at a facility that you can visit, there's still a mandate and a lot of a lot of gatekeeping in between mm-hmm. you and that person. Um, one of the little strategies that we did during that time is that we had a, a list uh, of quotations that we, we could view mm-hmm. in our operating system. And the funny thing is we were, <clears throat> we were trying to figure out how to see the customer to make the phone call ring, the, the phone ring. Right. But we were viewing 400 quotes a month that the customer was already calling us. So we, we kind of used the strategy. We went heavy on quotation follow-ups mm-hmm. uh, and having conversations on the phone or via email uh, to communicate with the customer. And believe it or not, it kept us, it kept us terribly busy. Um, we gained a lot of things just by providing that attention to the quotation itself, but we already had the attention of the customer at that time. So it was a, a little easier engagement you know, sometimes uh, the face-to-face, it, it may turn into a conversation of a softball game that your kids were at right, or right. the basketball game that you went to this weekend. But when you follow up to a phone call with, with a phone call about a quotation that the customer needs, the engagement is fully business. And um, we, we, we saw a lot of good results. Good. So what is it like to to lead uh, a sales team in, in this day and time? I mean, is it, is it, what are the challenges that you, you've seen over the course of, since you've been the, the manager? Well, I mean, it, I, I kind of saw a lot of things uh, dating back into all the way to 2012, if, if you had to use a timeline. And um, in that era, you still saw, uh, you saw a lot of I hate to call it old school sales techniques, mm-hmm. but it was a lot of uh, a lot of entertainment. Let's call it right. entertainment um, bonds that were were for life, and sometimes it was uh, personal slash business bonds. Um, you saw a lot of that transitioning away towards the 2014-15 range, mm-hmm. um, where it was less who you know, but how do you do? You know, more process driven. Uh, versus relationship driven in the sales world. Um, I came from a sales world that was uh, more hunting style versus right. farming style. So I had, I had a good idea uh, as a farmer of what hunting style sales was. So, um, so for, for those who may not 
have a background in sales. Okay, I'm sorry. Describe, no, it's okay. <laughs> Describe what you mean by hunting versus farming. Well, I think they even references hunting versus harvest, right? Okay. So, you know, kind of keeping with the H&H. &H. So go ahead and tell us yeah, what, that, okay, what a, that hunter is. The, the hunter is actually someone who is designated um, in an extreme hunting world, let's just say. It's a, it's a, pers a salesperson designated to find new business only. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole technique of in the 80-20 rule, uh, which funnels into from 100 phone calls on a Monday to eight presentations a day. Um, and it gets very extreme into presenting, presenting to new people to create new business only, and you move on. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I did in the past is um, we would create new customers and then there were follow-up service people that followed what I, what I created and, and followed up with that customer. So you were really hunting for the work. Only in, new in that. business. And yes. so describe that 80-20. So that out of your call rate, you're referring to the 80% fail, no return calls to 20. Success rate. Success rate. Okay. And again, it's, there's a lot of statistics of um, a cold call is rarely, I mean, almost rarely, successful on the first call mm -hmm. so there's like six calls that you can make thereafter and then the and then the statistics get better and better um if you're going by the book right mm -hmm. you know people like to believe that they are they are the best at their first time face to face when actually the person that calls on more people uh that's not as successful with that skill they they actually complement it with activity level versus seeing five people a day and trying to trying to land four sales that person's going to call 40 people a day and land four sales. Mm -hmm. You know, if he's a one out of 10 versus nine out of 10 person. So, okay. So that's the hunter. So let's talk about the harvester, the, the harvester or farmer, um, is, is the type of salesperson that has an account already created that they cater to pay mind to, um, bring to lunch the, the, you know, the, the typical right, salesperson, right. um, the company that I work for, we actually, um, we're more farming related. We, 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 we make sure that the competition is staying out of our customer, mm -hmm. which requires a lot of time, especially if you have a, a customer list that exceeds 100 customers, you know, and a lot of us do. Yeah. Um, but what our main job is to be sure that um, that we're providing the customer with the solutions to their problems. And that varies in, in different ways. But but at the same time, if a customer uh, if we create a new service or a new product line and we see a customer that could use it, we become a semi hunter at that time. Mm -hmm. But it's with an established, formed uh, customer already, a goodwill customer. So, right. But yeah, other than that, it's, it's uh, the farming part you'd think would be easy. You know, you have an established customer, it's at the top of your list, and uh, they, 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 we utilize, they utilize our services and product 80%. Uh, it's until you don't have that anymore. Right. When there's a manager that changes or a new guy in town or uh, positions change. And we saw a lot of that during COVID. Right. You know, a lot of people moved on to different industries. Um, and a lot of people had gotten switched around in job positions. Uh, myself, mm -hmm. you know, I transitioned from a salesman of seven years into a sales manager with a group of guys that are, that are all older than I am. But yeah. Like what you hear so far? Make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you and our generous sponsors. Thank you for your support. Now, back to the show. So what are some of the challenges you've had leading this group? Uh, uh, you mentioned that you're leading a group of people that uh, tend to be older than you. Have you seen any uh, generational challenges that you've, that you've had to assess in your in your short time as being their manager. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really interested in this because, um, right now we talk about here at Hask how we have five different generations in our workforce right now right. and how there's a really unique challenge to make sure you're, you're educating and, uh, relating and communicating with all five generations at once. So kind of curious as to how you, you handle that. And we'll, we'll have to get into this topic because, uh, the worst thing that a sales manager can do is, is to assume that everyone's going to do the same thing the same way. 
Um, I like to use the analogy that I heard once that everyone can relate with the New Orleans Saints and Drew Brees when he was still with the Saints. Mm -hmm. Hall of Fame quarterback, exceptional person, everything all the above. What if you had 11 of those guys on offense? How good would the Saints have been? Had the receiver been Drew Brees, the, the snap, the tackle, the guard, everyone be Drew Brees. So everyone had their own part. They're all built different. They all have their own skill levels. Um, I'll use two different guys that uh, we currently have on our sales team as an example. We have an executive level type sales rep. He's been with the company 44 years. Um, he is, he's a different type of person. He's right. uh, heart and soul with our company, uh, has bled for it, and, and made a lot of sacrifices. But he is also, uh, he'll do anything for the company. Mm -hmm. He'll put the company before himself. Right. Um, different Which level. is rare these days sometimes. Well, I mean, if, if, uh, if you have them, hang on to them. Yeah. Kind of thing. Uh, we've also just rehired a, uh, another sales rep that also heart and gold, black, uh, blue. I want to say black and red. That's the bishop colors. <laughs> but he's blue and yellow. He's mm -hmm. very Morgan City Reynolds, has been for a lot of years. Different style. Not executive level style. He's more of the... 10 minute, 15 minute lobby talk mm -hmm. kind of salesperson, but he's going to cover 20 customers a day. And then he's going to go to the office and then he's going to make 20 more phone calls that day. Right. So these two guys both have the same heart within the company and have two different styles of selling. And strategically, we hired the, the gentleman that I referred to as the non-executive level. Um, strategically, we hired him back um, with the focus of recovering uh, revenue that we have not seen in the last two years, made up of about three or 400 customers. Mm -hmm. We knew his style. Right. He calls on a lot of people every day, and he's an eight to five salesperson, not a nine to three salesperson. And we kind of knew that going into this hire, and we strategically hired him back to be the, the gentleman that serves as many customers and gets us as much story as we can get from these 400 customers that we haven't seen revenue from. And currently he's on pace from recovering about half of that revenue, which is quite a number. All right. So we, we've been pretty proud of a few things. So I guess, you know, leading that into leadership, how have you looked at the different roles that those two play as well as yourself? You started out with talking about the football analogy and these different characteristics. So back to leadership and kind of thinking about the roles on your team, you know, how does that play a big, a big, factor in, you know, um, leadership skills. And it's actually a hot topic for us right now as well. Uh, we, we're trying to do our best um, to let everyone know with our team specifically on all the resources that they have. I mean, all failures are not because of the weather, uh, you know, the lack of finances. I mean, it, COVID, COVID, yeah. you know, you, <laughs> COVID gets blamed for everything. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we've still got a way to use that as an excuse. You can see the attitude in, in people that, that went through COVID. They blamed everything on COVID mm -hmm. rather than looking for new resources. And I just kind of told you this uh, during COVID, we could have easily laid off the entire sales team. No one was going to see them. Right. But rather than doing that, we had to figure out one, what was one of our biggest issues? And it was quotation follow-ups. And when we addressed that, I realized it's also the activity level that this sales team can enhance in. And it, it separated us. You know, we, we stumbled into a few solutions that actually separated us. But um, awareness to all the resources, you know, the six reasons for three touches uh, strategy that we have is, um, is actually being aware of all of our resources, how you can use them, and qualifying the activity levels on all that. And mm -hmm. we use that in a CRM program that we've currently uh, began using. Cool. Well, you, you just mentioned your, your six touches. What, what are the six touches? What does it's, that mean? It's actually the six reasons. Six for reasons. For yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. And look, our six reasons are going to be different than other people's sure. six reasons. But uh, specifically uh, at the top of the list, um, we like to reach out to the customer with uh, a thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, as much as it doesn't seem relevant for a salesperson, a salesperson gets a quote, gets engaged, gets the order, pumps his fist, and he walks away. And that's what you typically will see. We call, we call the customer, email the customer, and we'll tell them, 
thank you for the invitation for the for the podcast. Uh, thank you for the the simple intro. Um, it, it's a big it's a big step. Thank you for right. the order. Uh, another one of the the things that we've really engaged in as another reason for us to to touch our customer is um, it's a little different than most. It, we actually address delinquencies with customers in a different way. You know, delinquency typically is, hey, you owe us money. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we have kind of discussed and, and strategized with, what if we sit with the customer and see what the problem is versus demanding only what you want, right. but actually seeing what the problem with the customer is and the delinquency. Mm -hmm. And it's changed the relationships. You know, we've even created payment plans with customers. We've, um, that at the end of the day, it creates a, a softening relationship. And that goes a long way with, with the AP group, especially, you know, with the people that are paying you that get harassed by everyone else. <laughs> and yet you're sitting down to, yeah. to feel their problems. Um, quotation follow-up mm -hmm. is one of our six reasons that, that we focus on. We have tools that, um, that show our customers what kind of rental equipment they currently have on rent with us. And what we do is that's almost like an unsolicited communication. We're sending that report to every customer every week just to make them aware that you still have this equipment with us. And uh, it's called our out items report. Right. And uh, what it does, it protects us in some ways where um, the customer may have forgotten to return the equipment. And that happens more often than you know. <laughs> well, I do know. It does, yes. <laughs> I, I've been in businesses and, and organizations where we, we would rent something and we would ha plan on having it kind of long term. And the next thing you know, six months later, it's still there. We're not sure, is it rented? Do we own it? What, what do we do with exactly. this piece of equipment, and, right? And yeah. we, we actually created that report uh, quite some years ago uh, in our old system prior to our, our last acquisition. And um, it's a very useful tool. It's very unique to our rental industry. Um, and it's, it's, it's communication that we do not expect a reciprocating answer. Right. It's just an awareness to mm -hmm. the customer. And the customer will actually engage in, yes, it's still on rent. Hey, I return that. Um, nonetheless, it creates a, a different type of relationship. Um, the, other, uh, the other, we have a, our, in our business, when we miss a rental, we document it. And uh, we, as a sales team, we'll actually reach out to that customer and ask them, hey, did you find the piece of equipment that you called us for? I know we did not have it for you. It wasn't available, but did, did you find it or can we help you find it elsewhere? Um, we also get into um, the, the, other, the other reasons can go on and on. Right. Again, mm -hmm. it can be customized to everybody. Mm -hmm. The more important part is, is the three touches side of the business. Uh, I mean, of sales, mm -hmm. the, um, that all, it, it stems from a conversation with a great friend of mine and, um, uh, in his industry, they used the term of three touches in a way of, of hunting new sales. Mm -hmm. You know, you can email the person, your prospect, you can call the person, try to meet the person face to face, the prospect. If you do not succeed in those three touches, you move forward to your next prospect. And I thought to myself, in a farming world, in the industry that we work in, why is it, why is it only that a face-to-face -face connection with a customer is the only thing validated in a sales report? Right. And it's been discredited for so long. So rather than discrediting an email or a phone call to a customer, and I've had personal experiences where it was the better option, Mm -hmm. especially in COVID times, mm -hmm. it was the better option to communicate with the customer. They may not have time for you. And the one experience that I did have, the guy was not even at the office and I, it was in my plans to see him that mm -hmm. afternoon. I couldn't make it. So I called him. He was away from the office. It turned into an order by chance. That doesn't happen. Yeah. That doesn't typically happen. So what we did was we validated phone calls and emails and we do it through our CRM program. Today, we do it as in our CRM program where mm -hmm. we credit the salesperson for a good email and a good phone call if it creates value to the, to the customer. Um, and you can't just expect the salesperson to instantly go from being discredited with a phone call to being good at a phone call. Right. And so we kind of used examples and we kind of uh, gave good instruction on ask a question that you expect an answer. 
not expect an answer, but can get a validated answer that would help operations, sales, whatever the region is, especially in, in the budgeting times. Right. But yeah, because because sometimes if you if you just validate just phone calls, I can sit there and speed dial all day long. But it's it's the value of it. that phone call, right? <laughs> Correct. Well, yeah. I, I find this so interesting. You know, we, I'm director of account management here mm -hmm. for Hask, and so um, the thing I find interesting is that. There's not enough time in the day sometimes, you know, to do all those face to faces. And, you know, we, we try really hard to get out in the field and be with all of our members and have those face to face conversations because they really are more personal, personable. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the time, you know, and so having those quality touches via the different tools and methods, you know, um, I think is valuable. You know, it's just a different type, especially as we're, um, you know, one of our team members, Vanessa here on staff, she said, um, she had a really great line and it said, you know, as our needs change, so should, should our solutions. Right. And so we saw that through COVID, you know, yeah. we had the need to still talk to people, help people see people do COVID testing has never shut down during that right. time, right. you know, but, um, we altered our solutions for our members, you know, and even the ability to do uh, virtual COVID testing, you know, and proctor that oh, virtually was, you know, something that our member came to us, said, we have this need, we figured it out for him. So, you know, really being able to be flexible and come up with some different solutions, you know, as, I think great points for, mm -hmm. you know, not sales, yeah. but, you know, any kind of application. And, and, and in any, any business, any uh, organization like you guys, um, it's a, it's about knowing your resources, you know, and that's um, one of the things I've listened to several times that people don't fail because of um, the weather, you know, they, they fail because of the way they view the weather. Yeah. You know, and not everybody hates the cold. Mm -hmm. You know, you tell the people in Alaska that people hate the cold and they'll laugh at you, you know. And so I, I believe it's it's more about knowing how to use your resources. But that comes with training, uh, awareness. And uh, as a sales leader, what's what's funny, I'm saying that is what I found more than anything when I became the sales manager, I realized that um, no one works for me. I work for them. Right. You know, my biggest focus is creating opportunities for my sales team. I said that the first day, uh -huh. you know, and I, and, I, and look, I'm, I'm talking to senior level salespeople that are now under my umbrella and it, it kind of made it, it made it easier for me to tell those guys, I, I work for you. Mm -hmm. You know, one specifically, I said, I need to learn a lot from you. So I'll be 25% teaching you, but you'll be 75% teaching me. Yeah. And, um, so I, I did not realize what I said, uh, because whenever every day that I sit down in front of my computer, the only thing I'm thinking about is how do I create opportunities for my sales team? And then we get into the six reasons for three touches. We get into our, our sales meeting structure and teaching in market diversification. Uh, that's how we survived yeah. during COVID. The oil and gas industry was not hot and heavy offshore. Right. You know, so we had to get very diversified. Um, Ninety percent of my job now as a sales leader is paying attention, not to my people, but to the industry, to the product line, to the changes. Um, everything is about paying attention. Mm -hmm. And so I have to find all my resources to pay attention, social media being one of them. Um, but I realize that's that's what's happened to me, how I've evolved as a as a person who thought they wanted to be a leader, got put in the role and then had to really get creative with being a leader. Right. So what, what you described is, is, is really the model of servant leadership, right? Uh, one, one, of my, one of my mentors told me one time and said, Tommy, surround yourself with smart, capable people. And then your job is to do everything you can to make them successful. And uh, that's, that's servant leadership in, in a nutshell right there. And it's, it's interesting to see that that it bridges all genres yeah. of, of the job. You know, it's not just, it's not just, you know, on the, the, the craftsman level or in a plant or Correct. anywhere else. It even goes into sales. You know, like you said, your, your job was to learn from your people and make them successful and, and set them up for success. Right. 
I, mean, yeah. I think that's a that's a great approach, especially when you're really trying to cultivate that culture. You mm-hmm. know, something we've been talking about recently is culture and trying to make it a good one. So you seem to, from from a leadership perspective, you seem to ha- have a very humble approach um, and and some unique perspective. And so we haven't really heard about your life story yet. So I thought maybe that might be interesting. My to, life story. <laughs> to, well, you know, kind of how you got to where you are today. So I thought that'd be a good segue to go to. Yeah, um, in, and I, I've been told um, how passionate I can be about some things, um, but something occurred in my life, and uh, I was a young man at the time. I was I was 28 years old. I was 2003. Mm-hmm. I contracted a lung disease <clears throat> that changed my life. Um, that's so cliche to say, but it really changed the perspective on life. I um, I was now in a situation where I was with a lot of questions and I had to have positive answers and um, which really changed the way I viewed other people. When people have a pity me situation and don't find ways to, to resolve their problems. Right. Um, the disease that I contracted is called MAC for short. Uh, it's called a macrobacterium evolium complex. I might say that wrong. Yeah, we won't. <laughs> we won't. Have that it's a long I, technical yeah. term. I was right? going to say, I guarantee you, we won't quote you. Yeah. But I okay. know your story a little bit. Do you, can you share how you got that? Uh, just because it was v- so random. Yes, it was. It was very random. I was. Um, I was in a public hot tub. Um, I was with my wife and my my son, who was three years old at the time, and um, I was I was on a trip. I was on mm-hmm. a fishing trip and I was in the, I was in that hot tub for maybe 10 minutes, maybe my wife and my son had their feet. I was telling them about my great day fishing and the timeline was about uh, six weeks when I discovered that I was, I was completely winded. I was a little out of shape at the time. So it mm-hmm. was a little confusing because maybe I needed to. You're like, is this me or (laughs) I ate too much or do I have a lung disease? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, So random. So, um, the, that's, that's how it, it occurred. Uh, Externally, what you could see was that I was terribly short of breath. Um, I had to stop every sentence to, and continue it. Um, I could not take a warm shower without feeling like I was suffocating and, People don't understand that. You know, people don't understand, I'll just jump in a hot shower and get out. And, and it, it wasn't like that for me. I tell a simple story, really quick story about the three steps that it takes to get into my grandmother's home. And uh, <clears throat> I remember viewing those steps every time I came through the sidewalk. And the challenge in my brain, not everyone else, was literally one step at a time, one foot at a time. Get to the top, gather yourself, don't pass out. And that's, that's where I was mm-hmm. physically. Yeah. Uh, internally, what I had was two thirds of my lungs were filled with a scar tissue, did not allow my lungs to contract. Um, to, it, it also occupied so much space in my lungs that it felt like I could not finish a deep breath without feeling like I was exhaling before I'd finish inhaling. Uh, to make matters worse, I had a bacteria infection inside that scar tissue, which uh, was very complicated for treatment. If, if you know anything about steroids versus antibiotics um, and scar tissues versus bacteria, it was, it was a mix. It was a bad mix. Um, <clears throat> I was, we, we had decided to, to go with a treatment that um, consisted of a combination of antibiotics. Um, uh, the main antibiotic that I took was actually the formula that I took was um, one that you normally get for a heavy congestion or a common cold. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll be prescribed somewhere around four to five milligrams for about four or five days. Um, it's Zithromax, otherwise known as a Z-Pack. And that's been common through the COVID times. Mm-hmm. Right. I was on 2000 milligrams for 24 months. So that was, if you can imagine what an antibiotic does to your stomach, it, it, it really, it re- but this was the solution. Mm-hmm. This was my only, my only chance. And, uh, another antibiotic that I took was um, called a Thambutol. Um, a Thamitol can cause color blindness. So I now had to go to an eye doctor on a regular basis to make sure that red lights were red, green lights were green. I drove every day for a living 
at the time. So I had to make sure the little things were, were correct. We're still working. We're right? still yeah. working. And I call them little things, but that's another and thing. Not a danger to you, your family and everybody else. Yeah. yeah. And everyone else. But that's another thing people take for granted, you know, is, is, is something like that. Um, one of the biggest side effects that the, the treatment took on is that uh, I now have numbness from the tops of my knees all the way to the tips of my toes on the pads of the bottom of my feet. It's, um, it's, a, it's a numbness that's caused from nerve damage in my legs, uh, something I live with to this day. Um, it's, I've gotten adapted to it, mm -hmm. you know, but it's a trade-off. You know, yeah. it's, it's somewhat of a trade-off. Um, we were supposed to see this treatment take full effect at around six to eight months. Uh, by month 11, we had seen nothing. I mean, not 1% better or worse. Um, <clears throat> so my doctor decided at this time it was, it, was, it was time to discuss options. We had to um, evaluate what our best options were, and he gave me three. And I had, at the 11-month appointment, I had four weeks to the one-year anniversary of the medicine to make that decision. Um, he said, first, we, gonna, we could remove you from this treatment altogether and begin you on a chemo-type treatment, which is a different form of medication taken a different way. It's right. more periodic than daily, it's, uh, liquid versus tablets. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure what that treatment was called. Um, the second option was to wean me from my current treatment one at a time to see where my side effects came from, uh, if we could reverse them and kind of play it that way. Um, the third option was probably the most likely option was that I would sit down and make a life plan and say, this is how you can breathe forever. And it was very, very limited. Wow. Very, very mm -hmm. limited. So that was, that was the three options I had. You know, you don't always get the best cards, but you have to play them. Right. You know? and, and that's how I had to view it at that point in time. Um, at this time, I knew discussing this with the doctor that I knew with uh, due to a lack of oxygen that was in my blood due to the lack of breathing I wouldn't live a complete life mm -hmm. um, not the life you I were used to yeah that right. I, well that I had intent I mean when yeah. you're 28 years old you're thinking of the world right you know and now you're still I, young enough to have ideals right <laughs> yeah now, now I can't go outside after 9 30 on a summer day yeah you know and um but I, but personally I had made I'd made peace with myself I made peace with God. Um, it's okay. Take your time. The hardest part <clears throat> is that I wasn't afraid to die. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it hurts to say that. Right. And I usually choke up right after, <laughs> but I, I, it, it, it hit me beforehand. And, um, but I, I knew, you know, and I was, it's, it's different when you're in that world when your mind's thinking different, you're positive, but you know mm -hmm. the inevitables. Mm -hmm. um, my biggest fear was not to be able to say goodbye. You know, and a lot of people would say that, that are facing death or the likeliness of death, that they, they're afraid to not be able to say goodbye. Right. Um, the question that I had was, did I say enough and did I say it to enough people? Mm -hmm. You know, did, mm -hmm. did I touch enough people with, uh, with my life? Um, so at one point in this process, I decided that um, I would write a letter um, <clears throat> to all my family and friends who, who I would not be able to reach out to in case tomorrow would be my last day. Right. Um, that's the way I looked at it. And I started writing the letter, and then the letter became my story. It became the story that I wanted people to remember me by. Oh, I actually have the, the letter. Oh, Wow. So, Are we going to get to hear the letter today? Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, you sure? Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, there are details in here, and my grammar is pretty horrible at, at 28. I'm, so. I, I was going to ask, has this letter been edited over the years? <laughs> no, or no, no, This no. is the 28-year-old version. Is, uh, this is the 28-year-old okay. version. Okay. Uh, not exposed to real world, well, yeah. actually at this time. Uh, there are details in here that I didn't share with you, mm -hmm. uh, but I thought they were relevant to describe who I am. Right. Or mm -hmm. why I am. And uh, how we actually got here today. And you're 28 years old. And, and, and what year is this? This is 2000. Uh, I was diagnosed and I contracted in 03, late mm -hmm. uh, 03. And I, I was diagnosed in 04. Okay. Catch. So this is about 04 you're writing this letter, right? 04, actually, okay. yes. Um, 04, I'm okay. writing this letter. Okay. All right. <laughs> so nice. uh, I'll read it. Okay. <clears throat> Most days I awake 
before my family and I wonder, how can I be so lucky <clears throat> to have these people in my life? Tragedy has faced me so many times and I continue to bounce back, although I feel so weak. My glory days are over and I have faced life ahead. My experiences are so many to be counted and tears cleanse my face as I think of them. As I exit my room, I pass below my sick cross. I usually refer to the words of my favorite prayer. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the strength to change the things that I can. <clears throat> I was eight years old and had taken our first vacation without my older brother. At that age, it was kind of a relief because my brother always had to keep me in line and watch my every move. We were enjoying ourselves on many of beautiful days and when my uncle received the call. My mother was escorted from the beach before we had a chance to get out of the water. Eventually, it was my cousin who had explained to me that my brother had been involved in a serious car accident. It was said that he would not to live through the remainder of the day. Again, I was eight years old and preparing to lose my only brother. My brother was strong and athletic young man. He made it through that day, but continued to struggle with his injuries for the rest of the summer. I lived with my family in Florida while he was in the hospital. I was without my mother, father, and of course, my brother for quite a few weeks. I had missed them and worried greatly about my brother. As I got a little older, I realized how lucky I was still to have a brother. Excuse me. <laughs> he recovered from his wounds and began to live his life again. From then on, my brother and I had our bond. Two years later, my family had received another phone call. This time, the call was for my tragedy. I was 10 years old. I had been in a fatal car accident. A drunk driver was speeding in the wrong lane and struck our vehicle head on. The drunk driver was pronounced dead on arrival, and I felt like I was next on the list. The memories that I recall stayed with me for the rest of my life. The morning that I awakened in intensive care, I felt as if my body had been violated. Looking through the oxygen mask, everything appeared to be tinted green. My mind had wandered for some time, trying to figure out what had happened. Pain had taken on a new definition. Coping with that pain was something that I learned. Relaxing and breathing were techniques that I used every time someone asked me to move. I took baby steps through physical therapy and I dealt with new pain every day. On top of physical methods of dealing with my issues, I would bring myself to a, a peaceful place mentally. Regardless of how unbearable everything seemed, I would tell myself that everything was going to be over soon and that we were gonna be okay. I had that, I'd said that so many times that I truly believed it. Little did I know that the words of confidence were not of my whisper, but of my faith. My faith in God. It has been 18 years since my car accident. I've shared those stories repeatedly. Some people feel as if they, they must pity me. And some feel that I'm fortunate to be have been rewarded financially for my pain. Personally, my award or reward is to be able to speak to my brother, my father, and my stressed mother. Unless you have been there, it is difficult to understand the family that most people take for granted. I've been extremely blessed with many experiences since my tragedies as a child. I have seen, I've been successful in athletics. I've met uh, many exceptional people, have had a few unbelievable employers. I have developed a beautiful family of my own. My wife, And my two children have conquered my heart. I still see me writing this letter.
They are the most unbelievable dream come true. Without them, my every breath would be less meaningful. Recently, that breath has been tested. On January 16th, I was told that I had a lung condition. At 28 years old, my life was fixing to change. Except this time I had a wife and children that would suffer through the drama. After two months of unsuccessful tests, I went through a surgery for an open lung biopsy on February 23rd of this year. I, later, I was later diagnosed with an atypical tuberculosis. I had never been short of breath my entire life. Now I suffer from it daily. I can do very to little or no activity without feeling like I'm suffocating. I will be on medicine for two years before they decide what to do next. My life has changed. It's changed for the better. Since I became ill, I've been put on many prayer lists and the feelings that I've had is unexplainable and I have not had the opportunity to share with anyone at the time. When so many people are praying for you or hoping that you feel better, your body feels lifted, unlike <clears throat> anything you've ever experienced before. Every effort that you make to recover seems intensified. Every morning that you awake, you feel as if the sun is brighter than the day before. And every hug that you receive seems to be your best. This is the power of prayer. There are not many mornings that go by that I do not cry due to my condition. I admit to questioning God. My question is not why me. It is how is it that I can be loved by so many? I was very emotional writing each and every one of these words, but I'll say that this is my story and these are my words. Alejandro Falcon, 2004. This episode is brought to you by AFPM Safety, Apache Industrial Holdings, Austin Industrial, Vic Alliance, and Brock Group. For a full list of sponsors, visit www.hasc.com slash sponsorship. Nice. Yeah, thank you for sharing. That was, that was beautiful. I think it just is a huge testament, you know, thank well, again, thank you for sharing that. That was, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I've never heard that as a friend. So that was yeah. my first time. So I'm trying to hold it together over here on the microphone. But um, <laughs> no, I think that just is a huge testament as to why we do what we do here mm -hmm. at the Health and Safety Council is just trying to, our whole mission is to build safe workplaces. So um, we, the focus is getting people home safely to their families, you know? And so you, you had major incidents, right. That we try to mitigate every day right. through training and, um, education and, you know, leadership and all these different resources and innovations been. And so it's just, you know, how much it's affected your life, you know, and, Absolutely. and how it could affect others. So with that story, how did, how did that change your perspective on leadership and how maybe you lead your team? Man, I'll tell you the, uh, well, directly related to, um, and look, there's there's more to the story on the recovery, and sure. uh, my thought process was, uh, and as I explained to you, this was kind of a story. The the part of the story I just told was more accepting what what things are. Um, it that changed, that ended up changing for me when I met when I met up with someone that believed in prayer, and and and, and um, I don't want to be religious about it, but um, he believed that he could put his hands over people and pray over them and, and change. And change their condition and he offered that prayer to me mm -hmm. uh, was not what I expected at all uh, but what it basically did for me it, it, it started questioning I started questioning things um, it was more the questions of what if he's right what if this isn't a test of my acceptance but a test of my strength and uh, but I had to figure out how do I overcome a disease that that clearly medicine couldn't fix at right. the time and then how do I overcome something that, that I cannot do physically. and I had to do it mentally. So um, as the story goes, I, I promised myself from that day forward, and this is the mental aspect, that I would awake every day and I'd tell myself that today was a better day. Simple. Today I'm a better person. And today I'm not going to be sick anymore. And I was sick. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it's, it's about, I don't want to say it's about lying to yourself, but 
um, I was ill and I was trying to convince myself different. And at first it was kind of like, I'm lying to myself. Right. I got used to repeating it. Uh, and some days later I felt better. And now I'm questioning that I just convinced myself that I feel better. And then don't, it wasn't the case at don't all. Don't they say like the, what's the, some kind of pill, like it's just like sugar water or a something. Placebo. Yeah. A placebo. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, was, that's, yeah. Right, that's right. It's something like that. Yeah. yeah, so I was I was in a situation now where I felt better, you know, and I talked about the decisions that I had to make. Uh, and my one-year visit did not go as anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, we had to decide whether uh, we go to a decision or that we continue doing what we're doing or so I asked the doctor, I said, something feels different. I'm still short of breath, but something, something's different. And um, I said, I want to do every test again. And in saying that, that was uh, quite agonizing going through some sure. of these breathing tests. Um, so we did a chest x-ray that day, and we, that was the end of the test. And that was the day I learned that my lungs were completely clear of scar tissue, bacteria infection. It was gone. I'm confused. Looking at the x-ray, my doctor's smiling and telling me that you did it. And I'm confused because I'm still short-winded. Uh -huh. It turns out that one of my, my treatments uh, developed a fluid buildup on the exterior of my lungs, which caused shortness of breath. And he said that that, would, that fluid would just dissolve in your body. And he was right, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, we decided to continue that treatment just to make sure we, we'd nip it in the bud. We beat the demon. And... Uh, and the story goes that in January of 2006, I was released from treatment two months early. It was my 30th birthday. Nice. So he gave me two months of no treatment <laughs> that I was expecting to have. Happy birthday. Yeah, happy yeah. birthday. <laughs> um, you know, realistically, my story goes back to uh, what do people do when they have a, a, a time of adversity? You know, it could be small, it could be big. But, you know, if I have the opportunity to reach out to someone and say, or that they hear this podcast, for example, and, and they're, major, they're facing a major adversity and that tomorrow they can awaken and just be uh, confident about challenging themselves right. towards it. And, um, you know, I'm about goal setting. And I know you guys are all about these goals and tasks. <laughs> and, but I'm also a big believer in that um, just because you've set goals does not mean that you met them. Right. And I've heard that several times in my career. Um, I have short term and long term goals. You know, my, my short term goal is to be unforgettable, um, to if, if I make an impact on you, whether I said or did something that that carries with you for a period of time. And uh, my long term goal is to be uh, irreplaceable mm -hmm. and the cliche everyone can be replaced. Mm -hmm. But uh, that someone still questions it's not Alex you right. know, when I'm no longer there. Um, but people that have uh, great skill at, at achieving goals, whether they're big or small, um, have incredible processes, you know, and it's about developing and trusting your process, trusting yourself. And I mean, that's, that's the moral of the story was, um, getting over a lung disease was not, uh, you know, a snap of fingers. It was a lot of things. It was a lot of a failed attempts. It was a lot of mental, um, but it was a process, you know, and everything going back to your question, um, the six reasons for three touches is a process, right? You know, it's, it's a formula, a structure for um, being consistent, uh, you know, being valuable to your customer first before you're valuable to your company, you know, and we see that that, that is a better return than any revenue, any margin that comes from sales altogether is if we put our customer first with what they need and adapt to that, then we win. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's about showing gratitude and that that's the biggest payoff is that the customer's loyal. Well, I have to brag on him for a second just because I know a little bit about uh, him. Um, what he didn't say is one of his goals was doing a marathon after his lung disease or triathlon, uh, I think. Yeah. Yes. I, I actually did. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you plugged that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So in case we ever get our own team here, yeah. you know. He's, yeah. he's, he's on it, right? That's yeah, right. I'll be the coach. <laughs> yeah, my that's feet right. hurt now. My yeah, back hurts. He'll be our leader. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so I was released from treatment in 06. I started with Morgan City Rentals in 07. Um, my boss at the time was a triathlete, and I had always wanted to be a runner. Mm -hmm. You know, and I said, I see these people that have this high off of running, but I've never been a runner. And uh, so he taught me how to run, and then we got into triathlons, and then I had to learn how to swim. You think you know how to swim, 
you know how to survive. Yeah. You know what I mean? Most <laughs> most swimmers don't know how to swim. No, not with people kicking you in yeah, the head while you're head. trying to so, race. Um, so I committed to a process that would eventually lead me to a half Ironman in 2015. Now, if you do not know what a half Ironman mm -hmm. is, it's, uh, it's a 1.2 mile swim first in open water. Um, you proceed that with a 56 mile bike ride and then you finish that race with a 13.1 half marathon uh, run. And I did that race in 2015 at right around seven hours. And um, one of the proudest moments. Oh, you know, of course. My, my dad was there. It was, it was just awesome. It rained <laughs> all day. Uh -huh. You know, it, it almost got canceled. I learned that the next day. Mm -hmm. But one of my proudest moments is to be able to say, I went from barely climbing three steps to finishing a half Ironman. And I have that, those numbers on the back of my truck, you know, that I ride around yeah. 70.3 and it's, you know, everybody gets on the 13.1. Mine, I think zero. Zero point zero. zero. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> those highly motivated people. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but really it's, it's, it's a symbol of, I don't give up. Mm -hmm. I don't give up for anyone. I don't give up for anything. And as much as you want to give up on a salesperson at times, you can't. Yeah. You can't, you know, in, 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 a, in a process or an idea or um, an issue that your company's having, you have to be the problem solver versus, versus the problem developer. Yeah. And another big thing I see with that is the importance of training. Right. I mean, how long did wow, you? Yes. I how long? That part. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> let's be honest. How long did you train steps. for that? Yeah. So I took baby steps just getting to that year. You know, it was the advice that I was given to start small right. on that small triathlon and then and then get in the longer distance. And then finally, I uh, the year before I trained, it was 22 weeks. I had a 22-week training session uh, for that. And it was uh, five days a week. You had two off days. Uh, but it was it was a lot. I was coaching at the time. Yeah. So there was a lot of midnight training uh, or 4 a.m. trainings before work. Uh, but it was something I was set out to do. You know, and it was nothing, nothing was going to stop me from right. doing that. And then, and I did it. I wish, I wish I had another one to go with it, but uh, maybe one day <laughs> Nina and I, or Tommy yeah. and I. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Don't hold your breath on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got, he can now hold his breath really well. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. speaking of breathing, yeah. I have lung capacity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Lung. Now, one of the things that I, I, I was listening to your story and what I heard is that, you know, you, you almost had to heal yourself mentally. The Before the body started to respond, right? You 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 were going through those treatments and you hadn't seen a whole lot. And then when you kind of committed to that that mental health, uh, is when you started seeing that progress, right? And I think that goes back to you can make so many parallels to that to our industry. Is I mean, we can sit here and, and have the greatest training and the greatest leadership training and and everything, but if you don't allow yourself mentally to accept that and be open to these concepts, you're just wasting air. Well, basically, not, not right? only that, literally. but yeah, yeah. literally <laughs> not only that, but you know, we do all the training beforehand, right. In mm -hmm. our industry every day, but then a, a big focus over the last couple of years has been mental wellness, right? right? Before you walk on that job site, are you mentally where mentally there for work? Or are you thinking about something else, you know? And so really being prepared mentally to go to work and, and be safe, not only for yourself, but, you know, for all those people you're working with. So right, good point on the mental yeah, wellness there. And in, and in sales, you, we talked about the 80-20 rule, mm -hmm. you know, but realistically people fail in sales because they can't handle failure, you know, and um, 80% of the time you're going to fail. And we use that analogy of the gladiator that, that, that is given the lion you know, in, in, in the arena, you know, in the gladiator days, uh, that gentleman would come out of a prison to fight a lion. And if he won, if he beat the lion, he gets his, his family's free. He and his family are free. Mm -hmm. But if he loses, he dies. You know, that's the two alternatives. So how does he enter that arena? You know, and that's mentally. Right. And mm -hmm. you're talking about focus and he's talking about his life, you know, mm -hmm. and, and in sales, if, if we walk into that arena, knowing that, you know, it's easier to die than to try to kill this lion. Then we're going to lose, you know, and it's, and you hear this, you hear this analogy all the time. And, and if a salesman goes door to door and says, you don't want to buy anything from me, 
Well, he's probably not going to be as successful as the guy that says, hey, what are your needs and wants and can I help you? Right. You mm -hmm. know, so it's it's about training, focus. Uh, but in sales, even if you focus, you fail the majority of the time. Mm -hmm. It's refocusing on starting again. You know, so never give up. Right? Never give never up. Give That's up. correct. That's right. never, you never caught give that. Up. Very good time. Never give up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm slow, but I, I I pick up on things every now and then. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah. Well, Alex, it has been a pleasure mm -hmm. having you come in and, and talk with us and share your story. It's Thank been you. very enlightening. Uh, it's just it's an amazing story, and I, and I'm glad you you took the time to share it with us today and 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 have those insights into not only your personal journey but also your career journey and and how that's helped you and and how it's all connected. Makes you stronger. So, yes, yep. I, I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the the it. leadership perspective of more of the servant leadership and kind of some some powerful tools and resources. Um, you know, there is a lot of attributes you used in your three or you know look characteristics that you used of giving thanks and um, educating and communicating. Really, are a lot of your three main focuses in your in your steps. So, thank you for that. That's yeah. good. Appreciate y'all having me. Yeah, right. absolutely. I enjoyed it. All right, that's it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Building Safe Workplaces. Be sure to tune in next time for another exciting episode. Till then, stay safe and stay healthy.